Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another wonderful episode of Untamed. Today, I got to not necessarily sit down, but I did have a wonderful um, conversation via the Skype machine with one of my favorite guys in the uh, strength conditioning industry. Um, If you've listened to all my episodes, or if you've even listened to maybe even a majority of my episodes, you've probably heard his name mentioned and referenced in a crazy number of times. Um, Mr. Tony Genelcore. Uh, we talk about you know how we got in the in the industry, uh, com- common mistakes um, in the gym by not only clients but coaches as well. We talk about assessments. Um, he gives me you know, gives us his thoughts on supplements and um, his nutritional approach. Um, you know we talk about the complete shoulder and hip blueprint. Um, you know some of his different publications. We talk about his blog, his writing style. Um, really fun conversation. Um, just to give you um, a better background of, of him, he uh, Tony Genelcore is a strength conditioning coach and writer. He co-founded Cressy Sports Performance back in 2007 and served as the head coach there from 2007 to 2015. He now owns and operates his own studio called Core in Boston, Massachusetts. His work is routinely featured in publications such as T Nation, Men's Health, Women's Health, and bodybuilding.com, and he also runs a popular blog on his website, TonyGeneralCore.com. Um, head over there after the episode uh, to get more information on um, his blog, his, his different articles, uh, different publications, and different products that he has available. Um, super, super fun conversation. Um, really, really excited I could finally get him on, and um, you know, I definitely look forward to uh, speaking with him again on the podcast or, you know, in person whenever uh, down the road. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Tony Genelcore. It's time to podcast. Hey, man. Oh, it's me. I mean, let's be honest. I don't know. You're the, you're the biology specialist. Lift weights and drink coffee. Time for another episode of Untamed. Uh, and I have to ask: um, Is uh, your rules on language? Because I want to make sure I respect that. So, if you prefer no swearing, swearing a little bit's okay. Like, what, what's your what's your preference? Well, um, the title of my show is Untamed. So, if that gives okay. you any indication, it's kind of okay. no, no holds Fair barred. Enough. I mean, I've had. If you get a chance to listen to like episode, it's like I think it's eleven. I had two of my buddies on, and uh-huh. that was just one we recorded like late at night, like 11 p.m. midnight, and we had a few uh, a few whiskeys, and so we kind of ah, let it loose. Right, so well, <laughs> it gets a little it gets a little out of hand. So, so if that gives you any I'm sure there's some colorful language on that one. Then there definitely is. There's a lot of colorful language. So don't okay. you feel you know feel free. Well, to I just want to make sure I don't want to. Not that I'm saying I will like purposely like go out of my way to swear, but sometimes it just comes out. So hey man, it's uh, all good with me. It's all good with me. Okay, cool. Does not offend me one bit. Um, cool. So I guess just to get started, I sent you some questions over email that yeah. um, I wanted yep. to ask you, and then I kind of opened it up to Twitter a little bit just to see if any of my followers were wanting any questions. And yep. I got a few a few questions, so um, I'll just kind of start. You know, so why did you get into the strength conditioning field, and you know, um, what was it about the strength conditioning field that really, you know, caught your interest? Oh, so we're starting now. Oh yeah. Okay, we're, rolling, we're, we're doing it live. We're rolling, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, man, what got me started? Well, I, I, I think the, the very cliched answer is uh, it's always been part of my life as far as fitness is concerned. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I tell this story often, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a rare breed in my immediate family in that I'm the only one that is remotely health conscious. I don't know, I don't know where I got it. Because uh, I don't recall growing up reading a lot of like uh, muscle and fitness magazines, or I, I really don't recall reading any of those. I just uh, I played a lot of sports growing up. I was very active growing up, and I think I just kind of naturally gravitated to the weight room, uh, particularly at my. Uh, it would you know a lot of people call their high school weight rooms a dungeon, but mine was actually a dungeon. It was in the bottom floor of the high school. Um, it smelled like mold. Uh, there were a lot of rusty plates and rusty barbells, mm-hmm. uh, and I remember going there after school 
many times during the week and uh, staying after and, and lifting and taking what, what we call the late bus home. Uh, so there was the original run of the buses that took everyone home. And then there was also a late bus for the athletes and people who had to like stay after for detention and whatnot. Uh, so I um, started using the weight room at a pretty young age uh, in high school and then um, just started recognizing that that was probably going to be a good way of me getting in shape for baseball um, and hopefully um, moving my baseball career to the next level, which was college, mm -hmm. uh, which it did, which it did. Like I, I was, I'm from a very small town in New York and not many uh, uh, people from my hometown had the opportunity of playing collegiate athletics or at least get to that level. And um, uh, thankfully I, w I was able to, to do that. And uh, I think I just at a, at a really young age just recognized that uh, lifting weights was, was yeah, it was gonna help me get better at school at, uh, at sports but then certainly there was the aesthetic uh, yep. um, what's the word I'm looking for um, component of it mm -hmm. where you know I like many guys my age I watched a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies growing up uh, I couldn't even tell you how many times I watched Commando mm -hmm. uh, that was <laughs> that I think that was my uh, Schwarzenegger movie of choice um, you know not to mention Rambo and uh, you know, Blade and, you know, all, all those like kind of cheesy you know, mid to late 90s, even in the 80s movies. So um, and then that just kind of gravitated to, uh, you know, once my baseball playing career was done in college, uh, it was time to actually go to school after that. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I couldn't just uh, major in, in baseball. Uh, mm. I actually had to get a degree. Uh, so I, I transferred back to uh, back home in New York. Uh, to a school that was closer to home, state school, and um, got my degree in health education. And um, that I had to do uh, uh, a student teaching placement because I, I was thinking about becoming a health teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, but then part of my concentration was also doing a internship for my for my for my concentration, which which was health wellness promotion. So when I was done student teaching, I then got an internship at a at a corporate gym that was just outside Syracuse, New York. And um, I did that for a whole summer, so three months. And they hired me uh, right away. They they happened to have a spot open up at the at the end of my internship, so I applied, and they hired me. And that's kind of when my <laughs> my career started. Yep. Uh, so I, I I did that along with some spot uh, placements at like various commercial gyms and around the Syracuse area, working as a personal trainer in commercial gyms and. Um, and now I'm speaking on this podcast. Yeah. So that, that, of course, that was a fa fast forward, you know, 17 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that that's more or less the, the start of my career in, in uh, strength and conditioning. Yeah. So I know um, I don't know if it was you or Eric Cressy who talked about when asking, you know, talking to former clients and, and athletes, their biggest regret was not having, you know, a strength conditioning program when they were in high school and I was kind of the same way because I played, I played with guys like, uh, Bubba Starling, um, who's on the Royals system, uh, Jason Adam, who's actually pitching for the Royals right now on, on the roster. Um, a guy named Connor Murray who, who played at KU. He can't, he's done now, but he had like three or four Tommy Johns. He used to just throw his arm out every chance he got. And I remember I was, I was playing with those guys under, a, um, I won't say his name because I don't know if he'll listen to this because it was kind of a bad experience, but it ended up being a positive thing for me. I was playing with all these high-level guys, and I ended up having the highest batting average. Now, I wasn't I wasn't a guy that was hitting doubles and triples and home runs, but you know, I was a middle-to-right guy who was just getting the ball in play, was getting on base, and had the highest batting average over these guys that are playing pro ball now. But at the end of the season, my coach told me, He's like, hey, man, I'm just going to be straight up with you. You're, t you're too small. You're not going to be able to play college ball. He told me that, and I was like a sophomore. I was uh, like, dang, dude, I still have two years left. Yeah. And so Jeez. that kind of lit a fire under me, and yeah. I started lifting weights. My dad was a power lifter in college, so he had you know, a very primitive knowledge of um, weightlifting, and you know, I was doing like bench press as a baseball player, straight bar bench press, which I know is like, What's the point of that? But I mean, there's a time and place for it. But sure, of course. Probably um, looking back on it, I probably would have stuck to more of a dumbbell bench approach, you know, an incline to make it more, a little more sports specific. 
Oh man, uh, I look back at how I trained through high school and college, and I would I would vomit my mouth now yeah. If, I, yeah. if I could go back and like punch myself in the face and say stop. Yeah. Stop doing arm day after a day after your start. Your arm hurts, so stop doing bicep curls. <laughs> yeah. uh, that probably would have uh, um, worked out a lot better for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. I was the same way. I was the same way. I love doing curls. Yeah. Um, love doing bench press. I didn't do a whole lot of squatting just because my that's how my dad got injured in powerlifting. Yeah. So he was like, yep. he was one of those guys that was like, hey, be careful about squatting. You'll mess your back up. And that's what was ingrained in my mind. And then. I go through school and all we're doing are, you know, single leg squats, front squats. And I was like, dang, and I sucked at it. And I was like, man, mm-hmm. going back, I wish I would have done more of this because I never had a actual lifting program at high school. It was kind of, um, you guys are going to show up for weights. We're going to do core exercises. We're going to go through a warm up, and then we're going to do some, um, you know, football specific stuff. And then at the end of it, We'll come back to the weight room and seniors will lead a, a lifting a lift for the day. So there was no, there was no real um, program for me to follow. So I was just kind of doing whatever the seniors told me. And I mean, they didn't know jack shit. So I didn't know what I was doing. And so power cleans, deadlifting, squatting, I mean, even proper row techniques and, and pull-ups, I, I had no idea. And looking at myself now, I know that, you know, being an overhead athlete, I'm, I'm stuck in a little bit of extension through my lumbar. And so that's one thing that I pay more attention to when I'm working with athletes. Cause I understand now that, you know, when you're doing overhead lift, you know, we want to keep the ribs down. We don't want them to flare out. And I definitely know when I was going up through college, probably till I went to an actual, um, NCAA program, I was just doing whatever I could to get the weight up. Mm-hmm. And I mean, looking back, I was like, dang, Reading that Cressy article, I think it was Eric Cressy. I wish I would no, have had yeah, a program. I think that was something Eric mentioned uh, a few days ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, and then he wrote like um, a pretty massive article on it, yeah. how like his hierarchy of needs for uh, a young athlete. And um, you know, I think it, the, ignorance is bliss sometimes, especially at that age. Because I mean, yeah, we might we can reflect back now and think about what we did and how stupid it was. Um, however, there's something to be said about uh, working hard, even if it is exercises that we probably wouldn't program now with more intelligent coaches. Um, but I, I guarantee, like I, I, I would have to say that I probably worked out a lot more harder mm-hmm. <laughs> in high school, right. especially than I do now. I mean, I certainly, I think I'm, of course, I'm stronger and I'm more, you know, I, I know what I'm doing now. But right. uh, I do think, uh, to some degree, ignorance is bliss because at that age, I mean, as you know, pretty much anything is going to work. Right. Uh, which is awesome. I mean, I, yeah. w- I think we, you and I both would agree. We, we wish we could go back to that stage of our training career where it's like you just look at a weight and you grow and you get stronger. Whereas mm-hmm. now it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little harder to add 20 pounds to your deadlift when you're already deadlifting a, a significant amount of weight already. So Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I think that's certainly an, an important role of, of, a, of a strength and conditioning coach now is understanding the uh, demands of any sport. Um, and trying to not necessarily emulate it in the weight room, which I think is a big mistake mm-hmm. a lot of coaches do because that's not the point. Um, but certainly uh, kind of helping to offset any of the um, you know, postural uh, uh, asymmetries that come into play or any, um, anything like that, you know, especially dealing with an overhead athlete. You know, you know they're going to lose internal rotation of the shoulder. You know they're going to lose elbow extension. So staying on top of stuff like that. And certainly any athlete is going to be – probably stuck in extension so understanding the intricacies of that and you know making sure that their anterior core control is on point and um uh and making sure they're getting movement from the right areas as far as their hips and thoracic rotation um but yeah it's uh you know part of me kind of feels like the the golden era of my training was was those very early days <laughs> right yeah. uh but uh but yeah you know certainly i i i wouldn't uh um uh, I lost my train of thought there, but I, th- yeah. I think you and I can agree on that to, to some point. Definitely. Because I, when, I, when I stepped into, um, I played baseball at Washburn here in Topeka, um, all the way down in, you know, middle of, the, middle of America, and they had just renovated their weight room. And when I stepped in there and I met the strength coach, he had just came over from TCU, and I was like, wow, this is a beautiful weight room. There's turf in here. There's like 30 squat racks. There's 30 platforms. There's TRX bands everywhere. 
I fell in love with just the setup of it. And then when I actually got in there, I was doing all these exercises I've never heard of before. And yep. just hearing the way that um, he talked about these exercises and how he was coaching us on these exercises and how I was using, you know, bands for like a payoff press. I've never done that before. And just the amount of intensity and how difficult it was for me because I've never done yep. an anti-rotational um, core stabilization exercise before in my life. And doing that, I was like, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. Yeah. And so hung my that's, cleats that's up. A, and, that's a cool part of our job okay, too is exactly. that uh, um, especially when we work with younger athletes, whether they're middle school, high school, into, into early years of college and being able to demonstrate to them, okay, this is the stuff you need to focus on. Mm-hmm. Like these are the big rocks that are going to make you not only a better athlete, but a, um, a better lifter in general. Right. Um, and it's going to help uh, offset injuries and probably keep you healthier. Um, you know, that certainly is a very rewarding part uh, of, of our job. Like I, right now I train, um, I mean, my, my, my student now compared to when I was at Cressy Sports Performance where 95% of the people I worked with were athletes. Now it's like 95% of my the people I work with now are general population. Uh, but I do have uh, a handful of high school athletes, baseball and basketball players, where um, it is kind of cool to be able to demonstrate to them, okay, let's work on your hip pins, let's work on your squat pattern. You know, I'm not doing anything crazy with them. I mean, it really is the basics. Mm-hmm. Um, and then certainly, you know, I'll, 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 whoop, I'll toss in a few uh, um, – uh, meat heady stuff for lack of a better term, just to kind of like, you know, cause I mean, every, everyone has that aesthetic yeah. need, it's uh, fun you know, too. guys, guy, guys want their arms to look big when they're, when they're playing in a football game or when they're playing a basketball game, you know, like they say, that's what people see. They, they see my arms. They don't see my, my erectors, you know, right. so it's like, right. uh, or they're not looking at my hamstrings, right. you know, I know that that's what they need to focus on. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, certainly we, we have a pretty cool job. And, um, you know, and, you know, amongst other things, you know, we get to wear sweatpants and listen to loud music and, you know, it's, it's, it certainly doesn't suck. Yeah, definitely. So going back to your studio now, so you were at Cressy's gym for about, was it eight years? Yeah. Uh, cause we co-founded it in 2007 and I left in 2015, mm-hmm. the fall of 2015. So what sparked you to leave? You just said, okay, I know, I know the business now. I want to run well, my own he thing. Well, and Eric and I had a really big falling out and fight. Um, I'm just kidding. That did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, God. <laughs> I see your, head, your eyes. I know. Wet. I know. <laughs> um, which we like to joke about that because when I did leave, that was – I couldn't tell you how many emails and phone calls I got from people. Like, what happened? Like, did you – it's like nothing. It was just it was just time to turn the page. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I just gotten married. Um, my wife and I had kind of a plan of what we wanted to do as far as building our life together. And I've been there for eight years and, um, and I even think Eric and even Pete, Pete Dupuy, mm-hmm. who's the, the business director there would agree in that my, my earning potential there was pretty much capped. You know, what the cool thing about working there, um, well, number one, the cool thing about working there was, 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 was help building it to what it became, which, which was awesome. I mean, we never thought it would have grown into what it what it became. So being part of something like that was very special. Um, however, I was also in that time able to build my own brand, um, you know, via my writing and traveling for speaking engagements and, you know, um, and stuff like that and building my website. Um, I mean, Pete and Eric had really couldn't care less how, how I did that. Like that was just part of the deal. Um, but as far as my coaching responsibilities there, um, I definitely had reached a earning a, a cap of my earning potential. Um, you know, and I was, but thankfully I was using my, my own brand to help generate other revenue streams mm-hmm. via my writing and via, um, speaking and being, do, you know, eventually doing my own products, um, to the point where, yeah, this, this, um, um, opportunity arose here in, in Boston where, uh, there was a woman who had a very tiny, uh, training studio about a mile from my apartment, wasn't remotely equipped enough. Like there was a a bench press um like a flat bench mm-hmm. uh, maybe dumbbells up to 25 pounds and an elliptical trainer and a treadmill and then maybe a few bands um uh, <laughs> so when i met with her and she was just looking for somebody to sublease the space when she wasn't using it mm-hmm. so and it's a mile like a, a mile that way and i know people can't see me pointing but it's right. a mile from my apartment um 
so when I when I met with her to discuss it, my my intentions weren't to uh, up and leave Cresty Sports Performance and like this is going to be my thing. I was just mainly looking at it as a way to get my feet wet as far as doing something on my own. Like uh, I had every intention of staying at Cresty Sports Performance and just kind of like I'm I'm one of my off days like start doing hours. Uh, at this other place and just start training people out of there but the opportunity was just so good where it was so close and so convenient and my wife and I are had already kind of starting talking about like okay what was going to be the next chapter and what, how how was I going to grow my business and my earning potential um, to where after I spoke with uh, Rebecca who is the the woman I was subleasing on her and, and, and said hey if I were going to do this would it be okay if I brought in a squat rack or a power rack and some more kettlebells and heavier dumbbells and plates and specialty bars and and she was like yeah fine <laughs> uh so i just kind of uh you know sat down with their compete and said hey I'm, I'm gonna do this like um you know they were all both very supportive understood and uh yeah, there was nothing weird that happened. I know people like to think there was, but there wasn't. Uh, but that's mainly why I left. It was just, it was just time to go. Right. Um, I mean, I spent eight years in my half of, at that point half more than half of my career uh, at Krusty Sports Performance, which of course I'm still considered a co-founder um, and uh, still immensely grateful for the time I spent there. But uh, but yeah, this this new it's not even new anymore. I've been doing it for two and a half years now, but uh, it's been great. Like uh, um, I'm in a nice little corner of my career where I'm, I'm coaching about 20 hours a week in a uh, people in person. Uh, and then that still allows me plenty of time to uh, do some writing and travel when I need to travel for, for speaking and, um, and, and, and starting to um, build some other products that are hopefully going to be coming out next year. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, I'm in a cool little spot. So, it's awesome. um, yeah, it's uh, I'm I, really nothing to complain about at all. I mean, it's certainly it's always it's, you know now that my wife and I like the monkey ranch is that we have a year and a half old. So mm-hmm. for the past year and a half, you know, I will admit that like continuing ad has been tough. Like you know, part of what, especially concerning the amount that I write and how much that of that is part of my uh, earning potential is, is writing. Um, it's been tough the past year and a half to um, go to my own, or go to other seminars and read and watch this. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I do it, but it's not nearly at the um, at the level of what it was pre-Julian, which is my year and a half year old. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and, and that certainly when I when I read other people's stuff, when I listen to them talk, that that's kind of the impetus for like stuff I want to write about and talk about. Um, so it's been it's been challenging the past year and a half. Oh yeah. Um, certainly business is going well, but then when it comes time to um, try to drum up like a new version of Complete Shoulder Hip Blueprint or like uh, do this uh, book that Brian Cron and I are going to be doing for the 40 plus lifter, it's like oh man, like I got to catch up on my reading. It's been <laughs> it's been it's been challenging. So um, you know it's uh, you know it's. Uh, yeah, that's all I can say. It's it's challenging being an entrepreneur. Like I know I went off on a little rant there, but yeah, um, it's uh, but no, it's been it's been lovely nonetheless. That's awesome. Um, I was gonna say I I follow you on Twitter and Instagram, and I'm pretty sure you just posted something about going to a baseball game with Eric Cressy. So I was just thinking yeah, about that, and I was to, like, uh, that, I mean, but we don't get to catch up that often. Like I mean, he's he's very busy himself, of course. Like oh, yeah. he has twins. He's a, he's a family man, and. Uh, you know, he's, he's bouncing back and forth between here and here up in Boston and down in, in Florida and Jupiter. Um, and I think that was the first time I have seen him in person in, in probably a year. Uh, the last time being, we randomly bumped into each other at Logan airport in Boston. Like I was on my way to a workshop. He was on his way to, t- to teach a workshop. Uh, so that was kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, uh, uh, him and Anna, his wife, and me and my wife got together for dinner and went to a, to a Red Sox game, um, which is always nice to catch up and you know catch up on life and kids and business and stuff like that. So yeah, so long story short, there was no uh, there was no fight <laughs> was no between fun, Eric yeah. and I. <laughs> is that, we're, we're still we're still very much friends. <laughs> is that just something you like to joke around with people? You like I to do. I like to mess with people because even even I saw that little light. Yeah, I was like, oh shit! Like, Whoa, what's he gonna talk about? Um, <laughs> Like this is an exclusive, um, yeah. It's uh, yeah. We're, we're, it's all good. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Um, so you know, you being a coach for so long, um, I know you've always talked about 
your advice to people that want to get in this industry and start their own training business brand, Mm -hmm. your advice to them is to always, you know, start out at like a commercial gym just to kind of be in that environment because it is kind of a, well, depending on the gym, it can be a hectic, chaotic environment where you have to adapt because, you know, you may want to use a piece of equipment, but there's two dudes using it. And so you got to be like, okay, well, I guess we got to try something else since these guys are around here. Um, so what are, you know, being in that environment and, and what, what, what are the most common mistakes you see not only clients make, but coaches make in the gym? Um, as far as coaches, I think, uh, I, I think the biggest mistake, I, especially now that I'm, uh, older, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm 41, I'm not old, but I've been, I've been in the industry for coming up on 15, between the 15, 20 year mark now. Uh, I think the biggest mistake isn't so much the X's and O's of program design or exercise prescription or even how to coach stuff. Although that is something we can talk about because I do see I, I, I still see a number of personal trainers when I travel have a really hard time coaching a deadlift, mm-hmm. um, which is which really surprises me considering the amount of information out there of like how to do it well. Um, I just watch and I'm just like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so that, that's, that's definitely a conversation we can have. But I think the biggest mistake is, uh, there's no patience. Um, you know, they don't, I think a lot of, I mean, and that's, that's part of the, the double edged sword of the, the era we live in now with social media and like people trying to find relevance in the industry. Um, you know, we've really fallen in this trap where in order to make it, you have to have X amount of followers and you have to have like this persona of like being successful. And the only way you're going to be successful is if you own a gym and, and that, that is far, far, far from the truth. Um, you know, I do think, uh, the way to get better in this industry is just straight out working your ass off and, and gaining experience mm-hmm. and letting things marinate and learning resiliency and like failing. Like I think learning how to fail well and not seeing it as like failing for the sake of failing, like, oh, I suck, but like learning from what like what made you fail and, and making and getting better from that. I think that's just the biggest mistake. Like, you know, a, a lot of younger uh, trainers coming in the industry now, if they're, they, they give themselves a year and they think they should be writing books and like speaking it perform better. And I'm like, fuck that. Like, like I don't even speak it perform better. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, no, you can just go like, to Germany. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean that to me, like maybe at some point I will perform yeah. better if you're listening, but, uh, <laughs> um, it's, it, it really, it really dumbfounds me that they, like, like people just think like because they've been working with some, they've been in the industry for six months that yeah, all of a sudden now they're gonna write an ebook and like all these people are gonna buy it and they're gonna make all this money and it's like, it's not how it works. Mm-hmm. It really, it really isn't. Um, and if it does, if someone does do it that way, they're very much an outlier. I mean, I mean, there certainly are people who have done it who have, who have had a quick rise. Um, however. Um, usually the ones that people tend to look up to are, they've been in the industry for a while. They've, they've put out tons of content. They've, they've, they've built career capital. Um, and that, and it's just, I, I just think lack of patience is the biggest mistake. I, I think a lot of, uh, um, fitness industry professionals make, mm-hmm. um, you know, and that, and if we want to get into like mistakes, I think people make in the, like on the gym floor, as far as coaches, I think the I'm a big fan of uh, the self determination theory, which is what my wife talks about a lot, who's a psychologist, and you know how to build autonomy, competency, and relatedness with your clients. And what that just means is basically giving people choice, not making them feel stupid, and and they and, and making people feel like they're part of a community. That's basically what those three things mean. Uh, and as a coach and as a trainer, if you if you have the skills to enhance those three things with your clients, meaning um, not using the assessment as a way to demonstrate how much people suck at their posture mm-hmm. and that they can't do this and they suck at that. And like, you know, it's just not doing that, like using that initial assessment as a way of demonstrating success to clients. Um, you know, if something hurts, making it not hurt or showing them a different exercise they can do that doesn't hurt. Or if they lack range of motion somewhere, implementing a corrective or an exercise where they see an increased range of motion. Or if they don't have a great hip hinge pattern, maybe showing them a hip hinge pattern that's less aggressive. Maybe it's a pull through and just, just showing success. Mm-hmm. Um, that's 
part of the equation of, of helping people build competency, uh, you know, and then, and then better matching that with um, or better matching our, our programming and the exercises we choose for people to better match their abilities and where their headspace is at. Because mm-hmm. um, certainly there, there aren't many people that show up on day one who have the ability to do a, a back squat, right. <laughs> or, uh, put a heavy bar on their back. Or a successful squat. back squat. It's yeah. just, it just doesn't happen very often. Um, and that's not to say that down the road that might be something that I end up doing with it, with, with X individual. Mm-hmm. However, um, it rarely happens on day one. So why not just use a goblet squat? Right. Uh, it's a squat. Uh, you're loading them. Uh, they, if it's, it's, it's pretty much a, um, a, 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 um, uh, a mindless way of showing people how to squat correctly. It's pretty, um, stupid proof. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyone can do it. I've yet to come, I've yet to, outside of a, a major injury, uh, I've yet to come across anyone who can't do a goblet squat in a matter of five minutes. Right. Um, so just stuff like that. I think that's a big mistake that a lot of incoming and, uh, trainers and coaches make is just lacking the, the soft skills of coaching where, you know, we tend to see, think that we have to do all this advanced stuff with our clients to show that, oh, we have to, we, it's like, I call it the. Um, the squirrel effect. Remember the the uh, the character Doug in the movie Up, where it's like squirrel, yeah, yeah. the dog. Um, you know, we you know, I think a lot of people have fallen in the trap of like, you know, we have to do different exercises that look cool and and and, and you know, or have a lot of bells and whistles. And it's like, no, I, I'd rather people just get really good at the basics um, and build off of that. And actually, because I'm I'm in the I'm in this industry to get people results, not to enter, entertain them. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and I think that if, if more uh, if if more younger fitness professionals gravitated to that mantra, they'd probably um, uh, do a better ha- have a, a longer stemming career because it, it's certainly what is the lifespan of a trainer now? A year and a half, three years? I don't know. I forget is what it? the numbers are, but it's very low. Is it similar um, to an NFL player? It's very yeah. It's very. I mean, it's. That's I mean, crazy. You no correct. I, I mean, I don't know, Ryan. Have you have you worked in the commercial gym before? I did in college, yeah. but in co- yeah. I worked as a fitness advisor, so I actually saw more of the business side. Yeah, where I was selling yes. memberships. And it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting. It's, the turnover rate's pretty high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 people, and I, I, I truly believe that uh, the thing that burns out most fitness professionals isn't the knowledge aspect, although that is a component. Mm-hmm. But it is it is learning more of those soft skills, and that's where working in a commercial gym is good. Because mm-hmm. you have, you have, you are going to be forced. You're going to be thrown to the fire, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Because um, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna get access to so many different people, so many different backgrounds, so many different training histories and injury histories that, and you're gonna have to be able to adapt. And you're gonna write this this baller program that, like you said, like if you if you if they're supposed to do squats that day and the squat rack's being used, um, okay, what are we gonna do? Um, I mean, just, just being able to like, you know, go to plan B as soon as possible, um, and not make it a thing. Like they, they, they're none the wiser, like the client's going to be like, okay, let's, that's what we're doing today. Right. Um, like I, uh, yeah, that's, that to me, again, another long winded answer, but, uh, that to me is kind of the, the missing ingredient for, uh, a lot of fitness professionals nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back on some things you touched on because I completely agree because I go to I work out at a commercial gym now with one of my buddies who I've kind of I work with him pro bono just because mm-hmm. I played baseball with him and um I was his best man at his wedding so I was like ah, I'll I'll work with you for free your movement patterns look like shit so I'd like to help you out and I mean he's seen he knows how to hip hinge now he can get on a straight bar and he can do a successful uh, sumo be- or sumo deadlift and he's over he's hit the 300 pound club and seen drastic steps with him just by doing basic awesome. stuff like you're talking about. But being in there, I see the, the other trainers that work there and I just kind of pay close attention just to see, you know, what they're doing and maybe I can steal something from them that they're doing and I can try it myself. Um, but what I notice, all of one, all of their assessments are identical in the way mm-hmm. that they coach or the way they talk to their client. And it's kind of what you said. They're telling everything to their client that their client is doing wrong or that looks bad. And I remember reading, I remember reading an article that you wrote about assessments and how an assessment is 
more of a tool to you know improve not to make them feel like they're broken yeah. and i've seen every trainer there do it and even when they're coaching a lift they're making yeah they're, and they're i telling think that's them that. just uh that's that's kind of the the growth of the fitness professional because i mean i i will call myself out and say early in my career that's what i did it was mm -hmm. like i tried to do as much as i could to say you suck at this you suck at this you suck at this you suck at this buy a 16 pack and i'm going to fix you like that, that was kind of the formula. Mm -hmm. um, and did it work? Kind of, sort of. Uh, looking back, I think I would have been a hell of a lot more successful if rather than doing the suck, suck, suck part, uh, I was more along the lines of like, let's, let's just, I'm going to go out of my way to demonstrate success to these people, mm -hmm. show them what they can do, show them their trainable menu. Uh, and then, and then that will probably set a better taste in their mouth. Uh, to mm -hmm. to work Definitely. with me and to hire me than me saying how much of a walking ball fail they are for 60 minutes. Right. Um, but I mean, I just think that comes with growth. I mean, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I hope I would like to think at some point everyone kind of has that epiphany uh, saying, yeah, this isn't a great formula. Uh, maybe I should uh, uh, change my uh, approach here. Uh, but I just think that comes with with growth. But but then again, that's where the turnover rate is. I mean, there aren't. I mean, I think the most once you get to like year five, year six, year seven, year of your career, like you're probably doing pretty well for yourself if you're still in the in the fitness industry. So you're doing something right. Uh, and I think you just become more of a people person, uh, and you, you th that those soft skills of coaching come come into play. Um, and that again only comes with experience. Like I don't think. There aren't many people who come into the industry right away that have that 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 feel. Right. Um, it, just, it it does come with experience. But I agree with you, Ryan. It's uh, you know, certainly I think uh, there there is a lost art. I mean, part of being good in this industry is knowing how to coach exercises correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, a buddy of mine at, we're we're talking about this yesterday as we were training, because uh, he he works in a, a gym here in Boston, and we were deadlifting yesterday. Uh, and he, he, he point blank looks at me. He's like, you know what? Like, I don't think anyone I work with knows how to coach a deadlift. And, the, and he has people who have been in the industry, like, like the owner of the gym. Uh, and he, I mean, it was just like, he doesn't know how to coach a deadlift. <laughs> like, uh, and this is the, I mean, these are people that have years and years and years of experience. And it's like, what the heck's going on? Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what the correct answer to that is, but, um, and that hopefully it doesn't come across as me being arrogant. Uh, certainly I'm not saying like, I think I know how to coach a deadlift, but I think um, you do too, certainly, but maybe somebody can, will watch videos I say and be like, hey, that guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about, mm. but <laughs> I, mean, I would beg to differ. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I'm like you, like whenever I travel and, and work out at other gyms, I me, mean, I think that's one of the, the characteristics of a coach is that we're always observing. Mm -hmm. Um, and our eyes are kind of always kind of floating, uh, and I, I'm always observing other trainers and coaches doing what they're just seeing, like how they're interacting with their clients and, you know, you know, arms crossed, not like just counting reps. Like that's, that's not, I mean, that, that's kind of what gives the industry a bad name <laughs> is when, right. you know, like body, like just, just general, uh, posturing and, um, like even stuff like that matters. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a rule when I was at Crusty Sports Performance, especially with the intern class coming in, like if we caught well, not that we would call them out, but if we ever saw uh, one of the interns like standing there with their arms crossed, like talking to a client or coaching, we, we would just kind of like, as a matter of fact, like when not in front of the client, but we say, hey, you know, like that doesn't look good when, when you know, uh, when, when we see that, like, you know, you need to put your hands at your sides or like, just don't cross your arms. Mm -hmm. I mean, just something as simple as that can uh, definitely goes a long way. Um, but yeah, you know, I think... Um, I don't know what the answer is as far as the, the coaching component of like actually be able to coach and break down a squat, actually be able to coach and break down a deadlift. Um, I, again, maybe it's maybe again, the answer is just experience mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. you know, the one, the ones that last in this, in this, this industry are the ones that give a shit. Uh, and they, they actually do go to workshops and seminars and read the right people, uh, and, and, and try to get better. Um, but yeah, I see it all the time too, my friend. Yeah. Well, I'm glad <laughs> I'm not the only one. Um, yeah. And another thing you kind of touched on with the squat, um, another thing that just bothers me is that if a client or an athlete doesn't squat well or they can't get to quote-unquote depth, the thing that bothers me the most is that everyone immediately wants to go to mobility, mobility, ah, mobility. Yeah. And I remember watching a video of you doing a, a plate-loaded front squat 
And I tried that out with one day. I was like, I'm just going to try this method with one class and see what the results are. So I had everybody grab like a 10 pound plate, something light that they could hold. And they all did um, uh, the plate loaded front squat. And everybody got to quote unquote parallel sure, with minimal um, lumbar flexion. Yep. And I was just like, wow, it was that simple. Yeah. Lo- load is magical. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, all I did was load the uh, interior you know, core. I understand why, why there's some coaches and trainers and fitness professionals out there who say like the body weight squat should look like this or they need to be able to do X amount of reps of body weight squat before we proceed to loaded. Mm-hmm. Uh, I get it. Like, you know, there, there's certainly markers that I'm looking at with a body weight squat that I, I don't want to see. Like, I'd rather not see knee valgus. I'd rather not see the heels coming off the ground. I'd rather not see excessive forward head posture. I'd rather not see a loaded or a rounded upper back. Um, although unloaded, not a big deal, but certainly I, I want to avoid that. Um, but on the flip side, I think we're going to be waiting for some people. We're going to be waiting a very long time if we just say we're only going to body weight squat for 10 weeks before mm-hmm. we move to I – mean, I mean, it's like – that's a lot of uh, loading and uh, progressions and 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 and, and uh, training effect that we're losing out on. Right. If we're just going to stick with, with okay, we got to work on your body weight squats not great, so we got to work on the ankle mobility. We got to work on ankle dorsal flexion. We got to look on. We got to work on your T spine extension in order to make that body weight squat look immaculate. Where I find that if we if we load people up, and I'm not saying like a one rep max load, like you said, you 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 use a 10 pound plate mm-hmm. and do a, a plate loaded front squat. Uh, that turns shit on. It gets people more stable and lo and behold, they're going to squat better. Right. Uh, it happens almost all the time and very, very rarely is the answer mobility. So if someone can't squat the parallel with a body weight squat, you know, we all, we, we've been programmed to think that it's automatically hip mobility and we got to, we got to like, we got to attack the hips. We have to thrash the hips. We got to poke the hips. We got to foam roll the hips. We got to un- unglue those hips. And for some people, yeah, that might be the case. Mm-hmm. But uh, I have found that most people are very unstable. Uh, they lack stability. So the reason why they can't squat to death is because their nervous system is telling them, put on the brace because we don't want you to hurt yourself. Right. So you, you get people more stable um, through anterior core load them up a little bit, just helping them turn stuff on. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty profound how, how, how much their, their, their technique cleans up. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I do think a lot of the industry barks up the wrong tree, uh, with, with excessive mobility work and excessive stretching. There's a time and place of course. Um, but, uh, I think, yeah, load, load is a, uh, an uncommon, facet of the assessment and uh i'm all for adding load uh just to help people get into better positions yep and i i got a a great quote from andy galpin who's um he's out of california he works with like olympic athletes and he said you're either optimizing um or you're um what is it now i just messed this quote up (laughs) you're optimizing or you're adapting and i think that's a great quote because at a certain point, you know, you're going to hit your peak to say, and that's a, that's a lot of issues that I have my friends that are coming to me and they're saying, man, I just can't get over this hump. And they're like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, just, I don't know, take a step back. Mm-hmm. Stop, stop trying to bench press. Stop trying to max every day. Stop trying to max every yeah. week. Just, and that's you too. Like that. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm not the first one to say this, but, uh, there are other coaches that have said it long before me, but it's, it's about building strength, not testing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think another loss component of, of, of programming and, 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 you know, and, and what we do as fitness professionals and coaches is sub maximal work. I think we, a lot of, we, we got to test it out. We got to train heavy all the time. And, you know, I found that, um, in the past year or two, like the biggest, the biggest change I made with my programming is including just more, more sub maximal work, like volume, Mm -hmm. um, right. Recoverable volume, not like killing people and making them like crawl out of the gym volume, but volume that they can actually recover from. Um, and and sub maximal training is, is, is awesome, you know, cause it, it, it's, it, it, it obviously 
training volume is good in, in the sense of adaptation on, and the physiological changes that we're looking for. But also, it really allows people to to hone in on their technique uh, and get in, get into a better position and maintain a better position while they're doing their deadlift, while they're doing their squat or bench press or whatever. Because um, I, I find that um, a big thing is a lot of people are unable to express their strength because they're just not in a good position to begin with. Right. So if I can get them in a better position, positional breathing, correctives, whatever, whatever you want to call it, and then go train in that better position using submaximal work over and over and over and over and over again, uh, they're going to get stronger. And if I can make uh, their three rep max, their five rep max for reps, uh, uh, I think I said that correctly. Um, yep. then, uh, that, that good things are going to happen and likelihood they're what they can do for three reps. They can now do for five. The likelihood that their one rep max went up is pretty high. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but I'm not crushing them with just like 90%, 90%, 90%, 90% or, or higher all the time. Um, and good things are going to happen. Like I, I think I told the, um, I think I wrote about this last year where I had a female client come in, um, who was working on her deadlift uh, and she's a trainer herself and she was, she was prepping for, I always forget the name. It's, um, strong first has a, a barbell certification. I forget, I forget the name. I don't know if it's tactical barbell or something, else, but it's through, it's through strong first. And she wanted to work on her deadlift and her squat, et cetera, to, to prep for, um, this test. And, and she came in on day one with a 300 pound deadlift. Like she's already pretty freaking strong mm-hmm. for, and that, that's strong. Right. <laughs> and, uh, Definitely. however, um, so I had her, uh, we had, that block was, I think it was 10 to 12 weeks of training, um, t- for the test. Uh, t- like it was like a weekend course and then they test out at the end of the weekend. Um, that whole block, uh, I think what I ended up doing, uh, was she, we deadlifted, I mean, it was twice a week for 10 weeks. Um, and we, I don't think I had her go above 265 pounds for the entire 10, 12 weeks. So like she, she, she's a 300 pound deadlifter, uh, but I didn't have her go above 265. Um, it was a lot of sub maximal work. Why? Because I wanted her tech, I wanted her to get in a better position. I wanted her technique to be pristine and I wanted her to build volume, uh, to get to a higher peak. Uh, make a wider base with more volume to get to a higher peak. So, and she she went to the workshop or the seminar, tested out at 350. Wow. So we added 50 pounds to her deadlift in a matter of 10 to 12 weeks without going above 265. Uh, so that was pretty cool. I mean, that that's an N equals one anecdote, but mm-hmm. it happens a lot. Um, where, I mean, you look at a lot of the more popular strength programs out there, five, three, one cube method, um, juggernaut, all of them, all of them incorporate a ton of sub maximal work. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it works. And I, I, I think that's a lost component of a programming. And I think it's a lost component that a lot of trainers and coaches miss out on, um, where it's just like, we don't need to crush our clients. Like I, I have another saying I use with my clients and I got it from Paul Carter who writes for T nation a lot. He it's called the 80% workout or 80% workouts. Cause you know, you and I, and a lot of people listening probably have a bunch of clients who feel like every workout needs to be a ball breaker. Every mm-hmm. workout I need to leave and feel thrashed and like that got the shit kicked out of me. Um, and there's a time and place for that, of course. Um, but I, I love the idea of 80% workouts and that 10, think of it this way, 10% of your workouts, uh, you're going to feel amazing. You're going to feel like a rock star. Those are the workouts where you hit PRs and like stuff flies off the ground and mm-hmm. off your chest and whatever. 10% of the time you feel like absolute garbage where you walk in. And it's like, I suck today. Yep. That happens 10% of the time. Mm-hmm. 80% of the time it's just, you go in and you do the work. You just do your reps. You get the work done. You, it's just a, a normal run of the mill workout. Those are the workouts that matter. Mm-hmm. It's like definitely those, those are the ones that, that, are going to get you better where you just go in, you do the work, you, 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 you and it's just like, you just do it like, you know, and you leave like the, you don't think anything of it like that. That's, that's the shit that matters. And that, that's, that's more of a mindset. I wish I, I try to implore on my clients and my athletes is like, 
you know, you're not going to hit a PR every week. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. So right. get that out of your fucking head. Mm-hmm. Like it's just not going to happen. Um, just come in, do the work, get your quality reps in. Like I, I want you to work hard. Like I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not implying that this should be like a cakewalk and, but you know, you, I, I don't want you missing reps all the time. Like I hate when people are missing reps, workout after workout after you see it all the time, guys like missing reps or repping out. And it's like, th- there's really no point in that. I mm-hmm. mean, I mean, Every now and then, yes, but to do it week in and week out, workout, 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 it, it just doesn't bode well. Um, so yeah, like it, it's just that the, that that whole idea of eighty percent is 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 huge. Yeah, I would agree, definitely. Um, so that'd just be to, funny if you're like I disagree with that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, really, I'd be stupid to disagree with that. Um, <laughs> no, no. Just because I'm I'm like you, I don't believe in. I mean, you, everyone has their philosophy, but I don't believe in you know, doing one rep maxing just because I get scared that if yeah. you, if you get injured and we're doing our one rep max and that's under, you know, my watch, you know, that freaks me out because then I feel, you know, I feel responsible for that because I'm having you do the one rep max. I'd rather do a five rep max or a three rep max and it's safer. Yeah, I, mean, and I, I do one rep maxes, but that's more so for people whose goal is to like, hey, I want to, I really want to crush my deadlift or I want to get my squat up to a certain level or if they're powerlifting, mm, yeah. um, then yeah, I'll do one rep maxes with them. But even then, I'm not doing them often. It's not like I'm doing them on a weekly basis. Right. You know, it might be. You know, if I'm testing, if if I am, if I if I trust somebody enough, where they 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 know how to handle their weight, they know how they, their technique is good, and I am testing their one rep maxes every now and then. I mean, I'm only testing it maybe once every two or three months. Like it's not like it. It really is not a weekly thing at all. Um, that that I I and I think most strong individuals w- would agree with that though they, they they don't test their one rep max very often Mm-mm. i think the last time i did a one rep max was almost almost a year ago yeah honestly yeah last time i tested my one rep max my dad was last october yeah um and it's been a while <laughs> so, same uh you know it's uh, yeah and, and then but there's people out there that do it on a weekly basis it's like why stop yeah. it's not working no <laughs> like, and you're gonna get you can get you're setting yourself up to get hurt because i mean sure. yeah. a one rep max is we know when we're maxing the body we know that technique one is not going to be perfect there's going to be some sort of compensation in that technique sure because you're overloading the body and perfect technique and I know for buddy one- morris well buddy morris who's the strength coach for their arizona cardinals when i saw him speak years ago um i remember him saying Whenever and it really resonated with me when he said this, it was like whenever uh, he had an athlete like hit a one rep max, and not even on purpose. It was just like he it was like one of those ten percent days where they just the weight was flying up. Whenever he had an athlete like take his body, his or her's body to a level that they've never been to before, he's like, "You're done for the day. Like yeah. leave." Like, yeah. and I and I and that it makes when you think about it, it makes a ton of sense because uh, I know when I. Last October, when I finally hit my 600-pound deadlift, uh, I was—I mean, I still—I I hit it, and then I still had the rest of my workout, which wasn't a ton of volume, but I, I had other stuff I had to do, and I my—I was not right that day. <laughs> like, yeah. uh, my—I my, mean, I remember telling my wife, I was like, my nervous system was like, I was like ready to just lay down, take a nap, like. I was—I was not right for the next like 24, 48 hours after I hit that lift. Um, and it makes a lot of sense when, when I heard Buddy say that years ago. I was like, okay, now I, now I, now I understand why where he was coming from that because I, I felt it personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it may, and it, it does make a ton of sense. Like it's just, I mean, not not to mention what you were saying too. Like, yeah, the technique is going to be compromised, like to some degree. Mm-hmm. But again, I have I have to really trust somebody. Uh, right. And I've been and I've been coaching them for a while that I know because I mean I do think. Uh, you know, learning what a bad position feels like and knowing how to correct that when in the in in a one rep max deadlift attempt or a squat attempt is important. Because um, again, a lot of times for me, hopefully it won't be compromised. But if it is, like they know to stay out of end range motion in, in the lumbar spine, for example, where they can kind of like fix it really quick and and get that better position. Um, but yeah, if, if for most uh, beginner and intermediate lifters, like that's not going to be the case. Like definitely, I definitely save more than one rep max te- testing for my more advanced 
yes. lifters. Uh, and I yes. almost never do it for beginners or intermediate lifters just right. because you're right. Like the, I, they, their technique's just not there yet. Mm-hmm. I, I think I just have trust issues. I just have <laughs> trust issues, which I'm fine with. Um, but I mean, there's, I mean, I could also make the argument that I, 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 I do find value in lifters, even beginners, like gr- grinding stuff out. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I do think beginner lifters, intermediate lifters can and should, um, train with heavier loads more often. And that, I'm not saying max effort loads, but right. I'm talking like 85 to 90% Still where they're doing max. like yeah. heavy doubles, heavy triples. Um, just because yeah, they're weak and that's, what's going to help get them stronger. And it's going to, it's going to, I, I do find value in people grinding out some reps. I mean, mind you, I, I don't want them to be grinding out all the time and doing forced reps and, um, you know, missing reps. But if, if, you know, if I get someone to do a heavy double and that second that that second rep of their double is, I mean, it's it's slow. Like that's okay. Um, certainly, I don't want them to hurt themselves, but I do find there is value in that just because it just helps build like some grit and resiliency, mm-hmm. um, and, and it gets people uh, mental fortitude, if you want to call that too. It's just kind of, um, I mean, there, there's part of there, there's that little bit of the equation as well. Yeah, or it's tough, but you got it done. Kind of mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. But when I did my max back in September, I was going to say when I when I walked into the gym that day, I felt I didn't feel like I didn't walk in there feeling like I'm going to hit a PR today. Yeah. But I put on the weight belt, grabbed some chalk and I hit the PR and I was like, well, I, I guess I'm hitting a PR today. And <laughs> granted, it was on the trap bar. And I remember posting it and I remember some guy commented on there. And he was like, now do a straight bar. I guarantee it's far less. And I was just like, dude, I, I yeah, don't care. No it's a trap yeah. bar. I still I lift it off the ground. I don't care. Yeah, it it's matter. still a PR. I was like, yeah, whatever. Man. I, that's that's what sucks about the internet. Yeah, I, <laughs> I just I just can't read comments. I guess. Oh well. Um, but switching gears a little bit, um, you know, what's what's your experience like when you have clients that come in and they ask you about nutrition and supplements? Mm-hmm. Like, what's your nutritional approach? So it's very minimal. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Uh, I kind of, I, I, I operate under the, uh, I, I know my lane mm-hmm. and I try to stick to my lane. Uh, certainly, I mean, I talk nutrition, like I, I'm not, I'm not an idiot when it comes to nutrition. Um, I mean, I, I can, you know, if someone has a general question about like, Oh, what do you think about the ketogenic diet? Or what do you think about this? I mean, I, I do have an opinion. Um, and I, I'll tell them my opinion. Um, but I'm not giving any, dietary advice or nutritional advice i mean i might say like you know what are you eating for breakfast well this this and this i was like maybe why don't you try this instead of that or maybe add a little bit of protein or maybe try to you know sneak in a little bit more fish oil somewhere like i i'm I'm perfectly comfortable doing that Mm -hmm. but if someone's looking for like a detailed diet plan or nutritional advice i just refer out to um nutritionists i know here in boston or friends I have who are, right. who are, who, that's, that's their role. That's their, that's their lane. Um, when it comes to supplements, uh, I usually, again, I'm very old school. Um, I say that, that word doesn't, we're not talking about supplements until we actually hone in on habits of your, uh, on your nutrition. Right. Um, like I, I like what, and, and that's, that's where I have like the conversation. Like, Hey, what does a day, what does a day look like? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, how can we, how can we get you a little bit more protein or how can we get you some more vegetables or what can we do to, um, hell, maybe we have to increase your calories. I mean, or, or decrease them of course. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I usually, I'm very minimal when it comes to supplements. Like I I'm, I'm all for protein powder. I think that's great. Uh, I'm all for fish oil. I think that's great. Uh, vitamin D for for a lot of people is is pretty uh, a valuable supplement to be taking. Um, uh, maybe creatine, and uh, and then maybe a greens product mm-hmm. uh, where it's like a just a, a powdered greens product. Outside of that, like I'm I don't really broach the topic of supplements with my clients because I was like. Um, I think Alan Cosgrove is the one that popularized this, the, the, the idea, but, um, you know, if your nutrition or your training isn't getting you to the aesthetic goals you're looking for, the, the X factor is not a supplement. Right. Um, 
you know, you need to look at, okay, what am I eating? <laughs> is, is my eating reflecting my goals? Uh, and how am I training? Is my training reflecting my goals? Um, so look at those two factors first, because more often than not, that's going to, that's going to be where the, the answer is. Um, not, not going to GNC and buying, you know, whatever fat booster they have on sale for 70% off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and then, and then too, like, I, I just think most people need to sleep more, uh, and most people need to drink more water. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, when people bring up supplements, I say, go to sleep, go to bed, <laughs> but that, that, that's going to be your recovery. That's going to boost your testosterone. That's going to everything that, you know, it's just, that's, that's where the magic happens is when you sleep and recover. Um, so go to bed. Uh, so that, that's usually where, where my talk starts and ends when it comes to, right. to, to supplementation. Right. Cause I, I, I've been, uh, been tracking my <laughs> calories probably for the past year now. And I know it's uh, not everyone has to do it, but it helps me because I know that if I'm tracking everything I'm eating, I know what, you know, what my protein looks like, what my carbs look like, what my fat looks like, what my fiber looks like, and my overall um, daily caloric intake. So that way, if I'm gaining weight, I know why. Or if I'm losing weight, I know why. And, you know, if I'm not feeling like if I'm not getting a amount of adequate amount of protein, I know that, you know, that's going to probably inhibit my quote unquote gains. Um, Mm -hmm. and I've noticed that it's eating whole food. I don't need supplements because my whole food is covering all my macronutrients. Yeah. And times Um, when I use, when I use protein supplements, like whey are days that, uh, let's say I know I have to go somewhere and I'm not going to be able to, you know, get chicken out or something or get the, get vegetables out. So, you know, I'll throw, throw a protein shake together and, and that's, that's what a supplement's used for, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's it supplements your diet. That's, yeah, that's the whole that's, point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, but but I think for I mean I, even with like fish oil, vitamin D, just for the the health benefits, mm-hmm. are, are, are kind of I'm on board with. Um, I I, I kind of consider them non supplement supplements. Um, when we start talking about like fat burners and testosterone boosters and stuff like that, that's right. That's where I don't have enough eye rolls. Because uh, right. to me, that's like. You know, for most for most guys trying to put on weight, like the best supplement is calories. Like, you need calories. Like, eat eat food. Right. Um, That's you just know, we science. Can, we can talk about like you know what are going to be the more ideal types of foods to be eating. Um, you know, but uh, but yeah, let's like let 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 your day to day diet take care of that. Don't don't rely on an extra eighty bucks on whatever. GNC is trying to pill your way. And th- it's funny you bring up GNC because I retweeted one of your tweets that was really funny that I got a kick out of. And you tweeted, went into GNC to buy an energy drink and had to bite my tongue when the guy behind the counter was trying to convince me how sugar decays the body and then went on to ask me if I knew about <laughs> keto. And you said, sorry, dude, wife's waiting for me. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was uh, hilarious. And that, that, ended up, that ended up becoming a blog post too, actually. Um, Perfect. Where I, where I kind of wrote my thoughts on the ketogenic diet and but yeah like the guy, he just immediately started have you ever heard about keto and I'm like yeah <laughs> I'm just like, like it's just like I was like oh man are we gonna go here like I just want I just want to buy my energy drink and leave dude like I don't want to and he was like oh, I mean I don't like to be ad hominem about stuff but I mean he I'm not kidding he maybe 130 pounds and he was like six foot. And I'm like, don't talk to me about sugar decaying the body, because I like, I was like, dude, fruit has sugar, right? Like, um, yeah, my, my, and in my head, I know where he was probably kind of going, like, you know, like soda and like people eating refined sugars. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna go out of my way to tell people to eat a bag of Doritos every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but if they want to eat a bag of Doritos, fuck it, they can <laughs> eat a bag of Doritos. Like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, ah. Uh, Man, it, it, yeah. I, I yeah, I couldn't get out there out of there fast enough. <laughs> that, it was just hilarious because I, I think it perfectly illustrates, you know, the supplement industry and just the diet fads that go yeah, on. Yeah, I and, mean, insulin is anabolic. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's That's, like, you, if you want to grow, you kind of have to like have your body release insulin, and right. the easiest way to do that is to eat carbs. Mm-hmm. Um, and pro, I mean, I know protein has an insulinogenic response, and so, like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you? So, are you familiar with Dr. Lane Norton? I am. Yeah, I follow him. Yeah, yeah. He's a good so dude. I, I follow him too, and 
I just I see him get in these crazy Twitter he wars. The, he fights the good battle. He yeah. does, man. And I'm like, man, I just I wish I knew as much as he did so that I could Be jump in strategy. there. Yeah. yeah, it's like a jump in there with him. And yeah. I mean, his whole thing is ketogenic diet. You want to do that? Fine. Cool. If you want to yeah. do low carb, high fat, fine. You want to be a vegan? Okay. Um, you want to do the carnivore diet? Fine. That's great. My point is, is that calories in versus calories out is the ultimate determinant in whether you're going to yep. gain or lose weight. And all those diets don't matter when protein and calories are equated. There's no metabolic advantage to any of yeah. them. Yeah. And then I always see people like linking to this study and that study, but what about like satiety and this and that? And I'm just like, it's all about what works for the person. Exactly. That's all, we're, that's all he is saying. And that's all what most like common sense people are saying. Um, I just don't get it. I really, I really, I mean, there's, and he's arguing with doctors and like dietitians yeah. and like yeah. people who know their stuff. I mean, they're obviously educated. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just for some, the blinders are on. I don't, I don't get it. I know. Um, it's crazy. I think it's, it, I, I mean, think it comes but down honestly, to... like, I mean, man, I can't imagine. Maybe they're so cranky because they don't. I mean, they're probably miserable because they don't eat fucking carbs. Like, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? They're probably yeah. lethargic and like, I, I don't know. Like, it's just, I would not want to live my life not having carbs in my life. I know. <laughs> you know? Me neither. Like, me neither. Uh, ah, man. I mean, if, far be it for me to tell somebody that the ketogenic diet doesn't work for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's great. But it's, it is not the end all be all by any stretch. Um Nope. But yeah, but that, but again, like going back to nutrition, that's why I do kind of like, I know my lane. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I ha- I might have some slight opinions on the matter when it comes to like stuff like ketogenic diet or the paleo diet or whatever. Um, but then I, I just, refer, I just say, go read Alan Aragon, go, go read Lane Norton, go read, um, Georgie fear. Um, I mean, I have, I, there's many people who are more knowledgeable than myself. I'll just tell people, go talk to them or go reach out to them or, you know, whatnot. Right. Um, so I'll say this. So yesterday, um, I hit my protein goal and it was about eight o'clock at night and I was still 1200 calories short of my daily total calorie intake. Yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to hit that by eating butter. No, you could, but it's probably not. You're right. (laughs) But what I did was I went over to price chopper, Costantino's bought a box of donuts, ate three donuts, had a glass of milk. And was still under my calorie goal. Woke up the next day, and I or today woke up this morning, and I was uh, about two tenths of a pound lighter. Yeah. And so I wanted to and you like pro- you probably look leaner too. You're probably more yeah. vascular. Like I mean, you probably felt it, you felt fine. Yeah, my muscles are more <laughs> pumped up this morning, and I just wanted to I wanted to document it just to prove a point. But I was like, do I really want the shit storm? No, don't, you don't want it. I didn't, and so I didn't. I don't. took the high road yeah. finally. Um, <laughs> But it's funny because like when I when I put that when I put up that tweet about the ketogenic diet and then I ended up writing about it uh, the following week, um, I did have a colleague of mine reach out and she I kind of I wrote about it in the article where she has a friend who's very much in the ketogenic diet. I, she didn't reveal who it was. I have no idea who she's referring to, um, but is a keto, like is a ketogenic through and through. Like I guess has a pretty good following. Um, it's all about keto keto keto. And, and she even said, like, I am I am basically the exact opposite as far as my approach to eating. Like, I am, am, I'm not anti-keto, but my approach is not ketogenic. Mm-hmm. Um, and our, 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 uh, our, our um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, blood tests uh, or profiles are exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. like, minuscule difference between, like, you know, as far as the markers, like pre-diabetes and, right. like, you know, you know, cholesterol levels and triglyceride level and they're they're pretty much the same right um so and, and there's many many people out there who will say the ketogenic diet is superior for like blood markers and this and that and it's like nope no it's not like if it works for you great but it's not superior right <laughs> i had a friend who did the keto diet keto diet lost weight and then quit the diet because he was like dude i just i felt so tired all the time and yeah and yeah. and I'm like, dude. Well, you got to think about the way you train too. You're you train yeah. more anaerobically than you do aerobically, so it makes more sense for you to have carbs in your diet. It's more yeah. efficient for your body, anyways. Yeah. And so he got back but, on. But his no, carb but diet. I mean, it's, it's uh, it decays the body. Yeah, you don't, you don't <laughs> want that stuff in there. Like. Yeah, it, you're decaying your body, man. You're gonna be tired, but you're not gonna decay your body. So think about yeah. that. Yeah. So um, no, it's like ah, uh, what? A, 
Yeah, <laughs> weigh your options, man. Um, but I just thought that was funny because I, I I retweeted that tweet about you going to GNC, and I have a buddy of mine. He's or my buddy's younger brother that I trained. He's a phenomenal athlete. He's walking on to Missouri State this year to play football, and he works at GNC. And he saw that tweet, and he goes, "Hey, man, I just hope I just want to let you know that not all GNC employees are like that." And I go, well, "Of course not." <laughs> I go, yeah. "I know that, you idiot." I've yeah. trained you. I've taught you better I hate, than and that. And I hate when people do that too on the internet. Like they think I'm talking to them. Like, yeah, there are bad trainers. There are bad doctors. There are bad right. lawyers. It's because I, I call like a, a, an industry out. doesn't mean I'm talking directly yeah, to I you. It's just funny I understand though. there are good lawyers and there's good trainers and there's good GNC Employees, ambassadors. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious that he just texted me after I retweeted that. He goes, hey, man, yeah. like, I'm, I'm going to let you know that we're not, not that all guy. like that. And I go, I know, man. I've exactly. trained you. I've talked to you yeah. about this shit. I know. I yeah. thought I thought it was so funny, but um, the zealots, man. I think I think it comes down to tribalism. Everybody wants to be a part of something. So if you can join the the keto tribe, then yeah, that's what people are gonna do. And I mean, I feel like the vegans have calmed down a little bit. I just don't hear a whole lot of vegan stuff going on anymore, and I think it's because no, they know. I mean, but I mean, it it always. I mean, that always that always dictated by what Netflix documentary comes out, though. That's so true. soon. As soon as the next one comes out, like the, we'll see a cacophony of, of them right. coming out. But they're gonna start um, telling us that eating meat is gonna be like smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. Yeah. Yep. All that yep. nonsense. Um, but that, I just thought that was funny. The GNC tweet. Um, <laughs> and let's see here. What else did I want to ask you? Oh yes. We're speaking of zealots. Um, your thoughts on cr- CrossFit. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've, I, uh, I've matured as uh-huh. a fitness professional. Uh-huh. Um, I think it was very, um, what's what I'm looking for, uh, not feng shui, but very like in to back in like 2006, 2007, 2008 to bash CrossFit, um, and to some capacity, rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think, but it's evolved, and you know, there's, there's. There's there's better coaches in CrossFit now, and I honestly think like I've been to a number of CrossFit affiliates. I have a number of friends who are CrossFit coaches, and I don't even think the bulk of when I when I when I when I walk into their facilities, like they're cross there is CrossFit whatever, like they are a CrossFit facility. They're not really doing CrossFit. They're just doing smart strength and conditioning with a little finisher at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, so are there still some that like? Are, are giving it a bad name yes uh however you know i i think it'd be it'd be really i'd be really hard pressed to um to give credit to any any one thing more um uh, for doing good for the industry as far as getting people to lift weights um and and be married to the barbell uh more so than crossfit so um you know, I, I, I don't bash CrossFit anymore. I have mm-hmm. a lot of respect for it. I have a lot of respect for the athletes. I can't do what, what the elite athletes are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so far be it for me to say, like, that's stupid. Right. Um, I don't think what they do uh, is good f- for what the bulk of people are also trying to emulate. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where people get hurt. Um, but that's that's a whole nother another conversation. Mm-hmm. But um, but yeah, it's um, I'm I'm a fan now. I like I, I mean, and I don't do CrossFit per se. Like, there's a CrossFit gym here in Boston that I go to and train. Uh, but I go during when the off hours when, when I'm the only one in there training. I basically have the place to myself for three hours uh, when I do go. Um, but they, I also know it's a it's an affiliate that. Um, one one of the coaches, the, the main coach there is, is a former CSP intern, and um, you know they're doing they're they're coaching things well, mm-hmm. and uh, but yeah, I mean they're doing stuff that me personally like, you're not gonna catch me doing handstand walks and handstand pushups and you know a lot of the stuff they do, but you know it gets people fun, it gets people jazzed up to exercise, it's building you know earlier when I talked about the self determination theory, it's building relatedness, it's building community. Um, you know that that's awesome. I mean, I, I can't I can't bash that. Like that that's a good thing. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't. I think I answered your question. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm. It, it's it's cool. Like, it's, <laughs> I, I I'm I, we're we're on good terms now. Yeah, I would say <laughs> I agree. I, I've kind of evolved too. In the beginning, everyone was. I think when I was like an anti CrossFit person was when. It was everywhere, and the stuff they were doing was like, 
all right, as many power cleans as you can do in 30 seconds. And I was like, that's not what power cleans are for. Yeah. Or my favorite, the thing I still hate the most is kipping pull-ups. Mm-hmm. It drives me nuts whenever I see people doing kipping pull-ups. And if there's any video of someone doing it, I just turn it off because I'm like, this is going to make me mad. Yeah. And I Well, I mean, and yeah, there's there's stuff I still don't agree with. Yeah. Um, but... 90% of it is pretty good. Right. Uh, you know, like I can't, and that's the thing too about the industry is like we'll, we'll argue about five to 10% of the stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 90% of it we agree on, if not more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, and that's kind of how I feel when it comes to CrossFit. Right. And I think the, I think CrossFit has evolved itself, like you were saying. Sure. I think it used to be, you know, if throw it on the wall, if it sticks, it's CrossFit to now it's actually, people are actually coaching movements. And, you know, it's I think of CrossFit as more of a sport um, than like a training modality. Yeah. So if you're doing CrossFit, I mean, I feel like you're training for sport in, in a sense yeah. because, I mean, they have the CrossFit games and it's it's a really big thing now. And and you're right. The people that do CrossFit, they bust their ass in the gym. And yep. I look at some of the stuff can't. they're doing and I'm like, fuck that, dude. I am. I would. I can't do that. That is so much. That is so much. I can't do that. I, nope. I'm just going to stick to my <laughs> I'm going to stick to what I do. I'm going to deadlift. Yeah, I'm going to do my. Me. Yeah. Um, but I just think like, I've even taken stuff from CrossFit, like doing, um, EMOM stuff, like every minute on the minute. Sure. Um, with, I, I used to do it with power cleans where I would do, I would have athletes do, um, you know, lightweight where I'm focusing on speed of movement. You're doing two reps every minute on the, on the minute for 10 minutes. And then, you know, I find that it helps them get into a rhythm and really kind of focus on rest time. Sure. And so, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of good, a lot of good results from doing that. And so I think I would agree with you. I've definitely evolved in my stance on CrossFit. Um, I think maturing is a good word just because, you know, it doesn't do, I mean, it, it doesn't, I mean, you think about it, like if I were to bash it now, like if I wrote an article or a tweet or Facebook status or whatever, what good is that doing? What am I accomplishing with that? Other than I really, it's not accomplishing anything. No. I mean, I, I think unless you're, unless I'm going to, uh, don't, what is it? Someone, a friend of mine brought up, don't bring up, uh, um, don't bring up, uh, um, a problem if you can't offer a solution. Right. Um, so, you know, not that I'm saying there's a solution to CrossFit, but I'm just saying that it doesn't, it, it doesn't really, it does nothing for me to sit there and bash CrossFit. Um, when I, when I wouldn't bash it anyways, I'm, I'm just mm-hmm. using this as an example, but, uh, yeah, when people go out of the way to bash this and bash that and bash this and bash it, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't make you look good. Right. <laughs> um, unless of course, like you're bashing something and then you have a legitimate, like, uh, answer or solution or train of thought or whatever opinion, uh, that's fine. Um, but just the bash for the sake of bashing, um, you know, I think, uh, we could do less of that. Right, less tribalism. Yeah, I think because that's huge right now, and we're always looking for something to be against or my team versus your team. When I think yep. in the fitness industry, it's we're one team, and I think if you see it that way, you see there's a lot more resources out there, and I think it just makes you a better coach or a better weightlifter yeah. if you can use different techniques and and implement them because. I mean, I definitely do that. I definitely take things from you, Dean, uh, Dean Somerset, Cressy, um, Tony Villaney down in um, at XPE. I mean, even my buddy. Um, do you remember Matt Hinkley? Yes. Yeah. So yes. I'm buddies with him, and and he's got his gym now in Kansas City, KCSC, and he's doing awesome things down there. And I and he's got if if you follow his Instagram, he's he do he does basic movements. He's teaching these kids how to move and. I'm super excited for him because I think he's really kind of putting Kansas City on the map a little bit for strength conditioning, and and I'm a big fan of what he's doing. And so, I mean, I mm-hmm. take stuff that he does, and I've had him on my podcast a couple of times. I've been I've lifted with him before, and um, and I I wish more people would be able to see it as you know see us as resources and not as competitors because I don't I'm not here to compete. I'm here to you know join the the community and try and have my name be up there with Tony General core and Eric Cressy. So people can say like, I want to take stuff from Ryan. I want to take stuff from Tony mm-hmm. and Eric and Matt Hinckley, um, Dean Somerset, um, Brett Contreras, um, Lane Norton. And I mean, I think if you take a piece of everybody's pie and you put it together, I think that it's just going to move the industry forward. And 
I think it'll get more people interested. Yeah. Like, like using CrossFit as well. Can't, can't disagree with any of that. So that's kind of my, you know, when I, I think when I was first coming out of college, I was kind of set in my ways just because I had trained a certain way at, at Washburn and I wanted to continue that. But then I realized I can't lift everybody this way because not everybody is going to respond the way, this same way. Mm-hmm. And I can't, I can't do this cookie cutter um, coaching approach. And that was one thing I wanted to ask you is um, you talk about all the time that not everybody's going to move the same. So we can't coach every athlete the same in one big way was not everyone's going to squat the same. So why would we try and coach everyone the same? So what, what kind of harm do you think manifests from coaching a cookie cutter method where you want to coach every athlete the same way? Um, well, it's just kind of like, to, I mean, to, to summarize it, you, it basically just be like trying to pound a square peg into a round hole. Mm-hmm. Um, when we talk about anatomy um, and squatting anatomy, like we have different pelvis widths, we have different femoral neck lengths, we have different acetabulum depths, uh, we have different directions that the acetabulum is pointing as well as the femoral neck, um, we have different uh, femoral lengths, we have different torso lengths. Um, everyone's anatomy is a bit different, so to take a, a textbook approach to squatting, and apply it to 100% of the population, uh, it's just not going to, it's not, I mean, look at any kind of like bell curve, it, for a certain percentage of the population, it'll be a great fit, for a certain percentage, it's going to be a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, 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 you have to ascertain via using a hip scour and past training history and injury history, and just straight up experimentation um, to see like what, what stance and width feels better, feels more stable, feels more powerful, um, to, and use that like, um, the body is, is inherently asymmetrical. Um, so to force a symmetrical stance on everyone doesn't really do anyone any favors and you're not going to create any more, any more imbalances or dysfunctions. You're just using their anatomy to their advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's kind of how I uh, approach it. And, and I know when, when Dean and I speak together, that's kind of the message that we relay Um, but I know there's, there's other camps like in in the PRI camp, um, who think, you know, well, no, we want to get people into better, more symmetrical, like take the asymmetry and make it a little bit more symmetrical and then use that. And, you know, and I'm a big fan of what, what we would call a canister position when we talk about scissor versus canister extension versus, um, stack joints. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do take that concept, but as far as like, squatting stance and deadlift stance and widths and that's that's very much up to um individualization and just trying to figure out what, what's going to be the best fit for any one person um because everyone's anatomy bone structure is different um and i mean that, that's proven like that that is not that's really not up for debate like that's that's a fact um so you know i think as coaches and trainers like we need to do a better job of um uh, of just keeping that in the back of our minds uh, and just knowing that everyone's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, that, that, you know, and that's, that's, you know, moving forward, uh, that's going to probably be a better approach for the bulkier clients and athletes. Right. And I think a great example of that was, I think the other day, Eric, uh, Eric Cressy posted a video of, he had a six eleven athlete that was doing a front squat and he was kind of saying like, yeah, this dude is six eleven. Most people say tall guys shouldn't shouldn't squat, yep. but he has good squat form, so we're gonna squat him. So why not use it? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's just and another I mean, tool. And then you could say, for someone who didn't, like, we could still squat him, but it'd just be a box squat, right? Um, or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly if, if someone, I mean, you can't you can't just look at somebody and automatically assume that they're gonna be a a tight, uh, immobile athlete Mm -hmm. uh because they're especially in baseball like that's far from the case like you get a lot of big guys who are very hyper mobile Mm -hmm. um you know now then 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 the argument is like now we have to get them to control that range of motion you can't just let them do whatever they want um but yeah it's uh, if yes someone's 6'11 and they i mean i i trained a basketball player before he left for for college he was six six um I had him squatting, he, but I mean, but you know, he was goblet squatting deep. He was doing box squats. I mean, I was squatting him. Mm-hmm. Um, he did fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, every everyone's different, uh, and it's your job as the coach to to figure out how different they are, and that everyone's their own little special snowflake to some degree. <laughs> um, right. And that you know, but that's that's doing your job as a coach. Like you're you're keeping their best interests in mind. 
So what do you think about um, the notion that everybody needs to do hamstring stretches and um, a lot of people's issues with deadlifting or um, any kind of hip movement is, you know, hip or hamstring tightness or bullshit lack of flexibility. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, not, I think the industry as a whole tends to gravitate to stretching and we need to stretch, stretch, stretch. Uh, I make the case that uh, most people have tight hamstrings because they're not in great, uh, for lack of a better term, alignment to begin with. Like they they might be a little bit more anteriorly tilted and that's why they feel like they, they have to stretch their hamstrings because their hamstrings are already at on stretch. Mm -hmm. So again, if we, if we nudge them in a little bit more posterior tilt, um, that's going to put the hamstring on slack and, you know, and stretching somebody who already has a lengthened hamstring, um, is not solving the issues, kind of feeding it. Um, you know, and a lot of times too, you can do, I, I can't tell you how many times someone's come in and complained of like, Oh, I have tight hamstrings, but I have them do an active straight leg raise and they pass it. Um, from FMS standards, like there, there are two or if not a three. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, I was like, you don't have tight hamstrings. Like it's just, you might, you might not have a good hip hinge. You might have a good, you might not have a good posterior weight shift, or you're just not in a good position to begin with. So let's fix that. Um, and stop stretching your hamstrings. <laughs> and, so, uh, um, you know, or, it's, or it could also, you know, also be, you know, we could say weak glutes could be an issue. Cause I mean, you have somebody do, um, a glute bridge and if they automatically point to their hamstrings it's like, well, you know, maybe your hamstrings feel tight because they're being overworked mm -hmm. because your glutes aren't doing their job. That's your that's your body's number one hip extensor. And if they're not doing their job to their full capacity, then the body's number two hip extensor, the hamstrings, are going to take over. So maybe that's why your hamstrings always feel tight or whatever because you're overusing them for everything. So, um, again, uh, very rarely is the answer more stretching for, for most people. Um, it's, it's really is like get them into better positions, get them stronger. Um, and usually good things are going to happen. So do you think that sometimes it just comes down to it's perceived tightness where yeah. it's kind of, it's more yeah. of a neurological thing. It's just kind of in their it head. Neurological, it could be, um, um, uh, protective tension. Mm -hmm. Like I think that that comes into play. Um, Again, that, that's why I use the assessment. Like I'll, I'll show them, I'll do an extra straight leg raise. I'll, of course, I'm explaining this to them. Like you don't look, you can bring your leg up to the to. I mean, the the gold standard for for hamstring or hip flexion is 70 to 90 degrees of hip flexion. Um, most times people get into that range, and I was like, if they do that, I was like, you don't have tight hamstrings. But but that doesn't answer the question like why your hamstrings feel tight all the time. There is something that we have to address. So then then I then it's my job to kind of peel back the onion a little bit more and they'll say, well, maybe it's, you know, we have to work end range hip flexion. I've done that before where it's like I have people, you know, actively pull their leg into active hip flexion, um, end range and they, they get more hamstring range of motion. Um, so that's not a hamstring issue. It's just end range active hip flexion that we have to work on. Or again, it's, it just could be, a, we got to get your anterior core on. We got to get your glutes to fire, get you in a better position. Boom, better. Your hamstrings don't feel tight anymore. So, um, it's just stuff like that. It's just doing our jobs a little bit better. Don't just point out everything that's wrong. Like, yeah, they, they, you can't dismiss what people feel. And like, my hamstrings feel tight. Okay, well, I just proved to you that it's not tight hamstrings, but what is it? Um, you know, and then and then go from there. So, do you think that um, you think foam rolling plays a big part in that as well? It could. I mean, uh, you know, I know there. Are, Guys like uh, Mike Robertson have spoken about this. Um, uh, Nicholas Lecamelli, uh, Nick Lecamelli, who's a, um, a manual therapist, he wrote a really good blog post on my website about the myths of foam rolling on my website last year. Um, they can speak to the, the, mechan the, the, the mechanics of it better than I can, but um, – you know, we're not we're not breaking up tissue when we foam roll. <laughs> it's just it's just not happening. Um, but certainly the mechan mechanoreceptors or like that pressure gets maybe gets muscles released or the perceived tightness goes away temporarily. Mm -hmm. And if it makes people feel better, then far be it for me to not use it. Um, I still have clients and athletes foam roll. Um, however, I don't make it like a 15 minute endeavor. Right. Um, you know, I just say like. Do a few passes over that area. If you find a tender spot, like apply pressure a little bit, let it dissipate, move on. Um, you know, it, we can't deny the fact that there are many people who feel better uh, after foam rolling. But um, you know, that's 
that's it's a very temporary fix. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's other more nefarious things at, at, at play here, um, and we have to address those. And usually it's just getting that pelvis into better position, getting them to turn stuff on, um, and a lot of times they're gonna they're gonna see a reduction in those symptoms. So do you think um, using foam rolling is more of something you have them do therapeutically? Um, yeah, do you I mean, see physiological uh, advantages to it or? Yeah. Um, Again, and, and, and we could even make an argument whether to do it before a workout or after a workout. I know uh, John Rustin's more of a fan of doing it after rather than before. Um, you know, and there's sometimes where I was like, well, if you want to do it later, do it later. Like, I'm, I'm not married to it. Like, if they come in already saying, I foam roll, it feels great, then I was like, okay, well, we'll include it. Um, you know, and I usually, I mean, I tend to, to focus more on like hip flexors, maybe their adductors, mm-hmm. um, maybe their hamstrings, um, and definitely their lats. I usually get people to, to foam roll that area. Um, but it's just kind of like, you know, like I said, there are other people out there that can explain the physiology behind it better than I can. I'm probably woefully failing right now. Um, but certainly, we're like I said, we're not breaking up tissue when we foam roll. It's just kind of like reducing um I don't know, is it pain tolerance or we're just kind of re- numbing the body, so to speak. Um, and it just, it, it, just, it just helps people feel a little bit better. So, yeah, therapeutic is probably the better term I'm after. Um, and if it gets people to feel a little bit better and then we do a little movement and then we go train, then I'm, I'm all for it. So in terms of um, you said you focus a lot on hip flexors. Yeah. Do you think, um, do you think the psoas is kind of in – a muscle that's kind of not paid attention to by a lot of yeah, clients but you're also, and you, coaches. I mean, well, you, you can't foam roll a psoas. Right, <laughs> right, you can't, definitely not. And I know people use like the Theracane and they'll do like a psoas release. Like that's not happening either. Um, you really need a good manual therapist to do something like that. Um, you know, guys like Mike Boyle will, will, is a big, they're big fans of like the psoas being um, weak and inhibited, you know, especially since that's the one hip flexor that acts above 90 degrees mm-hmm. of hip flexion. Um, you know, and, and that's certainly a valid point and something I, I, I yeah, it's definitely an underutilized uh, muscle because not many people train above 90 degrees of hip flexion, um, especially people, especially like endurance athletes. I mean, they rarely ever get their knees up that high. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not opposed to doing so as activation or, 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 or doing like band exercises to kind of help turn it on. Um, that, that definitely is part of the equation too. Do you think that that's a contributor to lower back pain? Um, it can be, I mean, certainly it, it far be for me to say it's not because it definitely attaches to the lumbar spine. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't um, attach to the, f- or, uh, insert of the femur. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Yep. So it, but it, but it definitely has attachments points on the on the lumbar mm-hmm. spine too. So um you know and I have had myself and clients in the past get um manual therapy on a psoas and they do get relief. Um so but yeah, I mean so, but like I said that that takes a pretty uh um uh good manual therapist to do that. Like mm-hmm. you're not going to do it with a foam roller, you're not going to do it with a theracane. Um you're not going to stick a lacrosse ball in there and get your psoas. <laughs> um so you know, it definitely takes um, uh, someone to get their hands on you to, to get that release. But, yeah, I mean, certainly there's many people who would say um, working on psoas as far as low back pain can help. But there's a lot of factors that go into low back pain. Right. Um, but, then again, if it gets people relief, it gives them relief. Like that's, you know, a- anecdotes count. Um, N equals one counts. Um, but then there, there are many, 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 many factors to consider when it comes to to low back pain, daily habitual postures and lumbar flexion and all there's, there's man, there's, that's a shit show of a rabbit hole if I've ever seen one too. So, um, but yeah, so as is definitely part is, is definitely part of the discussion. All right. So I do have one, I did have someone send in a question. Um, oh, yeah. his name it. is, his name is Mark Spreckles. He actually works with uh, pitchers. And so he asked me, he said, I'd love to hear you guys talk about um, spinal injuries in rotational athletes and any progressions or correctives that, um, you know, you would recommend. Well, when he says spinal injuries, did he, did he just use that as a loose term? Yeah, did it's he, a pretty loose term. Yeah. And that's one thing I yeah. wish I would have asked him uh-huh. like, well, can you go into detail about that? Well, he might be talking about like, ext- I mean, like you kind of, you and I alluded to it prior where, you know, most athletes tend to be stuck in extension. Mm-hmm. So um, that's I'm probably going to 
lean more towards that Mm -hmm. camp as far as what he might be alluding to. Um, So, yeah, I mean, certainly nudging them into a little bit more um, lumbar flexion, like doing some unloaded uh, breathing patterns in, 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 in lumbar flexion. So all fours belly breathing or bare breathing, whatever you might want to call um, some, some PRI positional drills there. Um, and just really, really coaching them up on, um, not like being stuck in extension all the time. Like it's like learning them to like learn how to actually pull the straight leg tilt their pelvis, um, is going to come into play. Um, so whether that's doing more, uh, anterior core work with like dead bugs or anything like that, like that, that's probably going to help. Um, but then with rotational athletes too, you got to make sure that they, um, are getting rotation from the right areas. Mm -hmm. It's like, is their hip mobility in check? Um, what is their lat, what does their lat length look like? Um, cause that, that can, that, you know, if they have, if they have pretty nasty lats, like that's going to pull them into extension. So a lot of times like, you know, getting some soft tissue work on their lats or their long head of their tricep or just in that like gunky area, like underneath the, the armpit, it's going to come into play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that, those would be some simple strategies that, that, that I would direct him towards okay. uh, as far as preventing any of that stuff. Cool. Um, well, but then I would just say, go read Eric's blog. He talks about <laughs> a lot about that stuff anyway. So just yeah. point him over there. <laughs> yeah. Cause I've done some exercises. I bought his high performance handbook and one, I wanted to kind of use myself as a Guinea pig Two, It's a great resource. And three, I've noticed how simple and effective the assessment he does on there is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, that was one thing that, you know, we talked about earlier was the assessment and I think if it's more simple and individualized, then I think it's more effective as opposed to making everyone go through 12 different movement patterns and then telling mm-hmm. them, oh, you suck, you suck, you suck. Um, uh, I had a point to this. I mean, honestly, if I, if, if I had to break down my assessment now, I'm looking at – I look at their squat and I look at their ability to put their arms overhead. Yep. Um, if that I was can a... look at those two things and then that kind of – and then and then if I see something awry, I, I use the assessment to see if I can see an improvement um, and that dictates my programming. So if someone if I, if I someone lacks shoulder flexion, their, the inability to get their arms fully over their head um, and, there, and nothing I do and the assessment fixes that, well, I'm probably not going to do a ton of overhead pressing with them right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'm going to kind of keep them out of that out of that red zone or out of that danger zone. Um, that's not to say we still couldn't do like landmine presses or bottoms up presses or, or like get ups or arm arm bars or anything like that. But um, you know, certainly stuff like that's going to dictate my programming. And that gives me those two things give me a ton of information. Um, and even looking at their push up, um, that get, that gives me a ton of information too. So definitely. Uh, yeah, it doesn't. The assessment doesn't have to be like super uh, um, advanced. Right. Uh, you know, I think it's more intimidating than anything. Like just those three simple things, like that gives me most of the information I need, rather than like, all right, you know, like put your arms in this position. Now do this, and you know, th- I mean, don't get me wrong. There's other stuff I look at. Like, okay, let's touch your toes. See how what that looks like. Can you? Are you actually like rounding your back there, which I want to see. Um, I don't want them to keep their lumbar spine locked in extension when they go to touch their toes. Um, you know, just simple stuff like that. And it gives, gives me a lot of information. So a great, a great exercise that I've been doing every day when I work out is, um, against the wall doing, uh, doing shoulder flexion. Sure. And really focusing on keeping my, um, my back glued to the wall. Yep. So that way I can work on, you know, not getting into extension when my arms go above my head. Mm-hmm. And learning to get my ribs down, and then uh, focusing on exhaling at the top of the movement, because that's really cha- I think that's a really challenging part of the yeah. movement is the ex you know exhaling. Um, so Mark, if you're listening to this man, I think that's another great exercise I would yeah. have your your overhead athletes do. Be able to be able to control rib cage is huge. Yeah, um, so it's a simple it's a simple concept, but for someone that's so used to extension, 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 it's so interesting to see how difficult that these athletes you know, have doing that. And I was working with my buddy Richard who he used to play in the, in the NFL and now he's coaching. He actually works with, um, professional tennis player, Jack sock. And I had the opportunity to, to train with him the other day. And Jack's hitting partner is a division one tennis player. And, you know, this kid was trying, we were having him do overhead, you know, some light overhead pressing and, you know, in a standing position and, you know, Jack, he's an elite athlete. So he understands, you know, to keep himself out of extension, 
but this other kid he's he's young he's a sophomore he was having trouble pushing you know pushing things above his head without letting his ribs flare mm-hmm. and so we put him um in a tall kneeling position and we told him to push his hips forward and to squeeze his stomach and right there immediately um we saw the aha moment because his eyes got big and he felt the movement um coming more through his you know coming driving it through his core and just being able to see like it's something as simple as getting someone off their feet and squeeze your squeeze your glutes squeeze your stomach and now and now press and then he noticed yeah. that it was drastically different for him yeah but it's just, just taking simple, joints simple. out of the equation yeah, yeah exactly um so that's a big thing too i love landmine presses because i think you're able to um do the overhead pressing movement and it's not necessarily a straight up and down movement. You know, you're kind of working yeah, through different yep. planes and that's one thing I, I think I wish more people would utilize, but I think it's underutilized, um, an underutilized, uh, movement. Yeah. Um, so are you, are you a big, uh, proponent of using landmine exercises and, and whatnot? Yeah. Love them. Yeah. I use, I use landmine often. Um, I mean, landmine overhead presses, yes, but I use the landmine for a lot of other things too, squatting, deadlifting, core work. Um, but yeah, landmine, landmine press in particular is, a, is definitely a staple. Um, do you use them for rows as well? Yep, yep, yeah. yep. So I like uh, landmine row, of course, metals row. Um, you know, there's, I'm sure there's other ones I'm not thinking of, but, uh, but yeah, like the, the it's a very... Uh, versatile piece of equipment for sure so um I'm, I'm admittedly i'm not as inventive as other coaches like ben bruno or anything like that when it comes to drawing like conjuring up landmine uh exercises but uh but yeah o- i mean again you don't have to be but right. o- the over like the vanilla overhead press is a very um uh beneficial exercise for the bulk of people out there mm-hmm Cool. All right. So last thing I want to touch on is yeah. um, your writing. Oh, okay. So <laughs> one of the one of my favorite things about about you is your writing because it's so unique and it's expressive. Yeah, I, I think I'm hard to plagiarize. So yeah, it's you like... are. Because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of humor tied in there. You know, yeah. you'll be on a you'll be you'll be going um, not on a rant, but you'll be talking about something, and you can tell the tone is serious. And all of a sudden, we take a left turn. You throw like a Star Wars thing in there. Yeah. Or just something that throws people off, and um, you know, wh- what kind of got you into that writing style? Uh, I don't know. I just think uh, I I tend to. I mean, I like to think how I write is how I am in person. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I've I'd like to think that. I think the bulk of people who meet me find find that that is the case. Where I'm not like some I'm not I don't have like some persona when I write, and then when you meet me in person, I'm like this weirdo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I feel I'm very much the same person in person that I am that how, when people read my stuff that I, that's me. Um, and that, that's just, that's a skill that I think, uh, takes time to practice. I mean, I don't think a lot of people having a more conversational approach to writing does definitely take practice. Um, it's hard to do. Uh, but, uh, but I also look back at how long I've been writing. It's been over 10 years now. So, um, you know, I, I, I do think I, I started off that way, but that's also I had a little nudging um, from TC Luoma at, at T Nation where when I originally started writing for them, he he was very adamant in telling me, like, listen, uh, I think you have potential. Uh, you just got to keep in mind that people want to be in, informed, but they want to be entertained. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's never more um, prevalent than, than in today's day and age where people have a very short attention span. Yeah. Um, so if, if someone's going to read a full article that I write, and I don't think my articles are like overly drawn out or long. Um, when I write a blog post, it's usually a thousand to fifteen hundred words, which isn't short, but it's not like it's going to take you fifteen minutes to read. Right. Um, you know, but if I'm going to write something that long on uh, squatting technique or scapular upward rotation or whatever. Um, if I'm going to keep people's attention <laughs> and, right. they, they want, and I want them to read the whole article, uh, I think it, it definitely helps to have, a, to toss in a little bit of that humor, um, whether it's self-deprecating or just like, um, cultural references. Uh, I think it just keeps people engaged. Uh, and that's just something that it's, you know, always came naturally, I guess. Um, but definitely it took a lot of practice too. And as far as 
honing it and making it seem more conversational and not forced. Because I think there's a lot of there's some writers that that tr- that try to do that kind of writing style, but it definitely comes across as forced. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it does. I mean, and again, I'm not saying that's the Blow, blow sunshine out my own ass but you know it, it definitely takes practice to become more conversational like a guy like John Romanello is very conversational with his writing a guy like Adam Bornstein is very conversational with his writing uh, Erica Sutter um, who is um, uh, a, a, a upcoming fitness professional like she's been in the industry for a while but she's she's been in the past year or two she's kind of done a lot of writing I really love her writing style it's very similar to mine um, and it definitely yeah, it, it just it just comes with practice, I, I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, but thank you for the for the nice compliment. I appreciate yeah. it. Because I, I've always <laughs> I always find it to be informative um, and humorous, and I think it's yeah, I think you're right. It's important because if you have all these big scientific words in there, people are going to be like, oh, blah blah blah, and then they're not I mean, going to finish it. Some people want that. I mean, that's you're right. Some people, people do. Read, some people. That's why people read Brett Contreras, or that's why they read Eric, or that's why they read Greg Knuckles. Um, you know, that's, they're very more, not to say that those guys aren't funny. I mean, they definitely have their own way of like adding in humor and stuff like that, but, um, they're definitely more like research here are the facts, like big words. I'm smarter than everyone. Here you go. Um, and then there's someone like me who can like, I'm, I wouldn't say like, I'm, I'm not someone in the industry that's more of an innovator, like in, like a Nick Tuminello or Nia Shanks, or like, like that comes up with these great ideas and like here you go world. I can take like what other people write and kind of give up my own spin, um, and say here's how I interpret it, here's how I use it, here's whatever. Um, but then yeah, I toss in the Lord of the Rings reference and boom, there you go. Um, <laughs> people read it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely a cool uh, a cool way to kind of get people interested in you know reading articles about strength conditioning and i think you know people think writing is dead i don't think that at all like i i know people tend to think like oh video is the way to go video 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 um i think if you're a good writer um people are definitely going to read your stuff um and you and and if you, you and that's not to say that you have to be like the humor guy you don't like i said there's definitely a market out there for like to the point writing like here you go here mm-hmm. here's here's the information like Here's the anatomy. Here's the physiology. Boom, biomechanics, whatever. Um, people definitely want that. Um, but I do think it it behooves uh, fitness writers to, you know, have a little bit of uh, fun with their writing. Uh, and, and and again, it's just it's just a little practice. Yeah, I think what's what's really funny is what you name your blog. Um, it's stuff to pretend while or stuff to read while you're pretending to work. Yeah, and I think I that's, don't know how I came up with that. I mean, years ago. I mean, that that's been a running series for forever. But I was like, okay, well, I think I came up instead of saying stuff to read, which is boring. Right. I was just like, you know what? As like, I, you know, if I had to think, like, most people are probably reading this while they're sitting at work, uh, whether it's during their lunch break or their whatever, and they're they're sitting at their cubicle or whatever, and they're they're, they're they look like they're being, but they're reading this while they're sitting in front of a desk mm-hmm. in front of a computer. So I was like, all right, I'm gonna name it that. So. Um, I think it tend to, to resonate with people. I think it's funny. <laughs> and I definitely... Well, it's supposed to be. So yeah. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad it worked. And I mean, I definitely, you know, I definitely read it when I was at work, but I was in a gym yeah. and I was probably and like... Now, I, now, now most people are on their smartphones, so I should, yeah. I should probably rename it, but it's too, <laughs> it's too late now, so... Oh, well, I think it's... Keep it going, <laughs> man. I think it's great. I think it's great. All right, man. Well, hey, that's that's all I had for you. Um We'll, so we'll uh, we'll wrap it up here. I won't hang up. Yeah. I won't hang up on you here just just yet. But um, we'll definitely go ahead and conclude. Do you have any uh, Do you have any conventions or any any talks yeah, coming I got, up? I got a ton of stuff coming out. Uh, you know, my website's home base. So anyone wants to find out my writing, social media, everything, that's just tonyjohncore dot com. But um, yeah, Dean Somerset and I are are set to start our 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 two version of our complete shoulder hip blueprint. Um, we're going to start that actually we'll be next month. We'll be in Houston. Um, so we will be, we'll be kicking that off next month. Um, you know, my wife and I are doing a workshop next weekend here in Boston, strong body, strong mind. So she's a psychologist. I'm the strength coach and we just kind of combine our expertise and, um, uh, make that a thing, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then at some point, uh, Brian Cron and I are going to be, um, releasing our, our, program geared to the 40 plus lifter um 
that should hopefully come out at some point next year. Mm -hmm. um, he texted me this week and was like, hey, when are we going to start writing on this? Because we did a guinea pig group. So okay. we took like 50 people through it, got feedback, and now we got to kind of like, you know, re-strategize and, and actually write the ebook. So um, that will be that will be coming out at some point in the next year or two or ten. So <laughs> well, awesome. I got to write it while I'm actually in my 40s. So um, <laughs> Make it relevant. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. All right. Well. Hey man, I really appreciate you doing this. Oh, thank you. I think uh, this would be a great, uh, great listen for a lot of people. Um, if you listen through my first like twelve episodes, I think I reference you, Eric, and Dr. Lane Norton and Dr. Spencer Nadalski. I think. Yeah, yeah. I reference you guys in almost every episode, so I think to actually That's finally awesome. get you That's on. An esteemed company to be lumped in with. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. So I think finally getting you on here, more people will be like, oh, now I see why he that talks guy. about that guy all the time. He's well, got I hope some... so. I'm, saying I'm, I'm a Nimrod or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, now they know. Um, <laughs> thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Um, hopefully, we can do this again in the future. Yeah, of course. Anytime. All right. Well, till we uh, till next time, everybody.